you know, uh, what's, what's going to happen around us is uh, really, really fascinating. Uh, over the next, in the interest of time, probably even the next 15, 16 minutes, one will just try and give you a little sense of what is this uh, so-called app landscape, what kind of opportunity is there in, ahead of us. Uh, Sandeep spoke about reimagining, and I've uh, pulled up uh, a couple of slides from somebody I've been following for many, many years who has been really uh, propagating the entire concept of reimagining business on the back of uh, what we have witnessed the last four or five, six years. First, initially, through data access and thereafter by mobility, and that's a lady by the name of Mary Meeker. Those of you who haven't, uh, you, should, you should certainly check that out. And then really maybe just talk about a little bit about you know, what app brands can do. So apps, if you think about it, we didn't even know about apps as an application and, or, or, a, or a geekier term of it being widgets. Uh, till 2007 when Steve Jobs in that same component and connotation of uh, making things simple uh, put a product out there which was really, you know, till earlier prior to that it used to be called widgets, which was, you know, you would touch it and, and it was really, you know, just giving a more complete experience than what you would perhaps get going onto a website as it were. But in the last three or four, five years, as smartphones have gained momentum, and as more importantly, the advent of the cloud has come around, the meaning of apps and you know, what it implies to a broader consumer and to businesses is really changing very, very dramatically. If you look around, this is, you know, this is typical. Uh, we would be here, even as Sandeep was uh, speaking, not meaning to be rude or anything, you know, you're instinctively looking at your phone, you're, you're, you're messaging, you're doing this, and this is a reality when you look around. Uh, a friend of mine, many years ago, I think about five, six years back, Mark Selby from Nokia, uh, at the Nokia World, uh, Mobile World Congress, where Sandeep and I have spent several, uh, we had a difficult time explaining, you know, back home, because inevitably the Mobile World Congress used to happen around Valentine's Day. And it wasn't that the two of us were holding hands, but we were, you know, sort of getting back uh, and, and trying to give explanations why. And now they've fortunately sort of moved uh, uh, this ahead. But Mark mentioned about four years back that, uh, I don't know where he got this statistic from, that there were 4.2 billion people who had toothbrushes at that time in a planet of 6.8. And by then, mobile phones had gone beyond 4.2 billion. Now, when you think about it as a category, it was really remarkable because that is more than people wearing slippers, more than people wearing trousers, more than people, any product category as it were. Of course, now it's, it's, it's gone way past that and uh, you, you're finding, you know, tele-density in various markets uh, being a lot more and that's where this entire advent of multiple devices is coming around. But what you need to bear in mind also is with apps, it's not just what's going to happen with the phone. This entire connotation of what we call as the Internet of Things. Uh, today, t televisions are no longer, you know, simple uh, televisions. The idiot box is becoming the smart TV. Uh, you, you go into your car and there will be, you know, connected uh, devices. Your uh, microwave in its own form is likely to take shape. And this is not one of those minority report kind of movies as such. So Mary Mika talked about this that, you know, uh, each cycle leads to a 10x kind of install base. So if you go back to the co core mainframe computers, it kind of peaked at about a million. When you go into the entire PC era, it went to about 100 million. And then phones, you know, and desktops. Uh, and now we are in a scenario where connected devices will go to closer to 10 billion plus devices over the next few years. And an app is essentially almost agnostic of what kind of ecosystem it may be in. We talk mostly about Android, iOS, and Windows, but you could very well create widgets out of, you know, a native kind of uh, ecosystem itself. And so bear it in that mind. Bear in mind the fact that multiples of these devices, uh, the fact that they are connected and these devices uh, are able to sort of, you know, uh, 
uh, have exchanges between consumers and what the activity is happening. And that's really what is leading to what we call as the appification of everything. I spoke about it. Uh, I mean, we're working on a project currently uh, with one of our partners, Sanjeev Kapoor, where we are putting an application into microwave. So the system microwave realizes that you like paneer because, or you, you like a chicken dish. And over the air, you know, it is able to send you uh, recipes basis that because every one of these devices now are coming with a little screen and uh, there you go you know that's that's really what's beginning to happen uh, we're also likely to as this entire thing pans out this whole connotation of connected homes why because all you've really done is you've brought once you've got that LTE which Sandeep spoke about every one of these devices because it has you know one little sim in it and all is that's expected is for it to transmit, you know, basic elements of information. So simple things like, why should I be consuming my washing machine, my air conditioning, uh, you know, my, my dishwasher all at the same time? Can I become more efficient by letting these devices talk to each other? It's almost like the machine saying, okay, I'm done now you, Mr. Toaster, can take over, as it were. And that's the kind of environment which uh, services like Nest, etc., are beginning to now uh, set, set example of that. I'm going to take you through a couple of uh, examples of how businesses are really getting reimagined, as it were. One of the examples which was talked about is, is um, you know, taxi services. You think about it. Uh, Simplicity of, I need a vehicle, one touch, and it tells you that there is so many of these vehicles which are around you, and you'll get one in the next four, six, seven minutes, as it were. Now, what services like Uber, etc., are beginning to do is something truly disruptive. A company like that actually does not have what you would describe as physical assets. Physical assets as in, you know, they don't have automobiles or whatever. When you look at the manner in which, so in a way, what they're really doing is they are creating productivity out of otherwise what would have been unproductive assets. And no wonder, that is the only reason why this company today is three times the enterprise value of Avis and Hertz put together, which collectively are about 16 billion, probably have you know, tens of billions worth of actual physical assets. And you're seeing this, this kind of example take shape across uh, Airbnb. Uh, as this business is continuing to grow, uh, you're beginning to find this entire connotation of do we really need that kind of hotel room? Or do I get a richer experience? And therefore, services like Uber and Airbnb are actually making you know, the global $70 trillion economy and, and these companies that have been responsible for these businesses stand up and take notice that will there be a time, not too far in the future, where consumers may say, I don't need a vehicle. I don't need to buy a car because it is so predictive that I will have my own personal chauffeur, you know, which is available two minutes from now, etc. Or I, I don't need those five, six homes which I bought on the back of, you know, that was one asset class which wouldn't dip as it were. Because, you know, now even if I have them, I'm going to be bringing about some productivity out of them. So that's the kind of, how many of you are familiar with something called as Tinder? I think this audience and most of us here are probably not the right uh, prospects for that. But uh, a simple, how it's being reimagined is, you know, youngsters would go into nightclubs, bars, places, and they were looking to meet, you know, uh, people from uh, other friends. And here's a matchmaking service, which all it's doing is it's essentially taking advantage of the location and the people around. And all you're really doing is with that one flick moving forward, uh, how traffic and a service like Waze Again, user generated. So you had maps and they bring all the utility with them. But suddenly when you have millions of people who are actually using that service and real time posting how it is, you know, 
that I was take this take this route as opposed to this, and that's you know creating an entire new experience and service, and that's ways for you. And it's happening across product categories. I mean, Philips took this up uh, as an example, wherein in their new range of uh, uh, light bulbs, they enabled an app which, because homes are connected now, you could be sitting and creating moods and creating experiences. And with this entire proposition, what's happened for Philips is from being a, just a utility company, you suddenly came into the lives of your customer in a far more meaningful manner. Something I'm sure they had always aspired to, but the aspect of device and connectivity kind of just amplified it to a whole different realm, as it were. We're seeing examples of this across hotels. Uh, one of the biggest trends is really what's happening with this entire space of what we call as wearables, uh, where, you know, uh, different types of devices are actually getting to capture what you are, uh, you know, uh, and recording various types of activities that you're doing, which to the point which both Ajay and Sandeep spoke about, which is really the big data and analytics. And to brands, my message is, don't look at the application economy as a mere better looking website. Look at it as you stood for something which was more than just the product or service. Today, when you have the ability of that customer being all the time connected, you have that ability to go one notch further and really become you know, a part of their integral lives in taking this entire thing forward. In the interest of time, I'm just gonna sort of switch past this, but uh, this particular slide just shares with you the quantum of data and information which is actually being analyzed. Somebody mentioned to me that we are now posting something like two billion photographs a day. So if you go back, what text meant to us quickly changed into a visual experience like photographs. And now video, which over the next three, four years as LTE and smartphones get rolled out, to me video will almost become like air. It'll be everywhere and its manifestation will be experienced by consumers across different forms. Just a couple of slides on this part most of us are aware of, but what's really likely to come the next couple of you know, years. I think touch and sensor as an aspect is going to be a very, very crucial part uh, in, in, in taking this. And as you can see, you know, across this, various devices you're talking of almost 8 billion devices which will have some element of sensor and touch as a part of their, uh, you know, inbuilt into them. With all of this and the fact that today processing data, bandwidth, you know, cost, access to cloud, and basic device costs, you know, Ajay talked about how one third of these devices will be less than 4,000 rupees. Everything coming down is really what is resulting in this big rush. And in my mind, at least in the Indian context, it's an opportunity of the next two to three years which is very, very disruptive. We will grow from about 250 million internet users to potentially 600 over the next three and a half, four years. We're adding about seven, eight million a month right now. And if you notice all the communication which is happening, whether it's by the e-commerce companies or some service provider or whatever, it's really this new battle for this new market share in real estate, which is, am I part of those 20? Because what that is leading to, it's leading to a change in the way we consume things and services. The example that I gave you about, you know, you click a button and you're getting a car to pick you up is a change in a certain kind of mindset. And this is that new battleground and that's really why this entire thing's happening. Just two more slides on how I feel digital media consumption, and more from the, for the marketeers here uh, to, to see this. I run a company, we, we, we are in digital media, to give you a sense, last year we engaged with, or rather transacted with 227 million unique consumers. We did little over two billion 
microtransactions. These, these were what we describe as digital goods, you know, uh, music, video, games, applications, as the case may be. We are beginning to see the first signs of how media consumption will change with the advent of streaming. We are already witnessing it today. There isn't a single thing that you, don't, that you want to see that you, if you were to search, cannot find on YouTube, as it were. This is the kind of patterns which are emerging, where if you see markets like India, you know, where we're somewhere down there, uh, the quantum of consumption that's likely to happen on the back of, you know, merely digital devices which are always on. And that results in, potentially, you're no longer in a market with 790 news channels, or 790 channels, only 280 news channels. Uh, but you're potentially in a market with millions of channels because everyone becomes a creator and you're in that sense. And with this, what's also happening is that's not the only thing they're doing. Whilst they're doing it, how many of us talking about uh, stories about our daughters? So I, I will add one uh, <laughs> to, to so, I mean, I get some of the biggest, she, she's nine and a half going to 10. You know, I've been following her the last six or seven years and for me, you know, that's the customer that I'm working for. So one of the most inspiring things I get is looking at what's happening around her. And I have a niece who's about four, four and a half, and I see the difference between the two of them. When my niece was one and a half years old, she got up to touch the television and she pinched the television. And I was intrigued. I immediately pulled out, you know, some of our physical photographs, as it were, from, uh, you know, and I handed over the photograph in front of her, and sure enough, she did the same thing. To her, that is as native, you know, an experience. The phones, the tablets of today, to this generation, are like the slates what they were for us, except that that tablet, that phone, is, you know, the world's library, the world's, I mean, you know, millions of books, uh, millions of conversations, communication, whatever it is that you want to do. And once you start getting into this aspect of multitasking for brands and marketeers, understand that the shift is no longer about creating demand for your brand via that print, radio, television, as it were. Because there are now enough examples when people are watching something on TV, competitor brands that same time are flanking them on their mobile. So you, because they, they have an ability to act, and in a market like ours where only 18% of our retail is actually in the organized sector, make no mistake, as skeptical as you may be about the valuations of these businesses and how a company like Flipkart, seven years is 13 billion, and my dear friend, Mr. Kishore Biani's company is worth half a billion dollars, as it were. This is the true reality of how it's going to actually sort of transition. And therefore, on the back of this, you are likely to see significant shifts move into the mobile medium as well. I'm sorry, this data is from the international markets, but you, you kind of get the sense. Uh, this slide particularly interesting because it draws the correlation between how time consumed to marketing spent. In a market like ours, for a $2 trillion nation, we are, what, $7 billion of advertising? Am I right, Sundar, something like that? I, I was in China uh, three months ago for a $10 trillion economy. In December, they ended $24 billion of only digital advertising spent. And that's the kind of shift that you are likely to see. So to me, brands are really going to be moving away from this linear communication to what I term as more immersive engagements. It's going to be shifting away from impressions to expressions. And this is not my saying. Two months back, I heard Mukhtar Kent, chairman of Coke, say this. He says, for 90 million community that I have on Facebook, we realize that for, for a brand which has been around 127 years, we've basically been you know, selling one product category, and we get consumed 1.8 billion times a day. But when it comes to digital media, we've realized that we've got to loosen up, he says. To me, that coming from, you know, brands which have had 
this level of, of aura around them and this level of control is really a sign of, you know, and therefore you're beginning to see this entire thing of, you know, it's not just about liking it, they want conversations to happen and it's happening across. And again, in the interest of time, payments, banking, I mean, you should just see the example of what a company like Tencent has done in the entire space of just that one little app and what all it em entails from uh, you can you, you do your banking, you do all, all sorts of uh, business and applications around uh, what gets done. I'm just going to play one video here for you to more to just stimulate your thinking of how the world of LTE around us is going to change uh, uh, things for us. Yeah. Can I get him? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Neeraj. That was really um, extremely informative and uh, a very well presented uh, uh, session. Thank you so much for that. And I think the Internet of Things probably is the next big thing that's going to come. Uh, and the cloud, actually, cloud-based technology is probably going to bring that to life just the way we saw it in the video over there. Uh, We'll open it up for, for questions now. We have uh, some time for questions, so I thought I'd just open the floor to questions, and if there are any questions, I'm sure there are mics around, so please feel free to ask. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you, Neeraj. Uh, it was a very enlightful uh, session by you. Uh, regarding mobile apps, uh, I have one question. 
Neeraj, you uh, very well in, uh, ascertained that mobile apps would be a main instrument by marketers to reach the, mark, to reach the consumers, to ascertain personal preferences, and do personalized marketing. But as a company, as a brand, how would you ensure that your app gets downloaded from the a huge array of mobile apps which is uh, available in the store. How would you ensure as a brand that your app is downloaded and is used by the consumers? Any, any insights on this? Sure. Uh, no, I was not, uh, firstly I'm not recommending that every brand, uh, you know, you need to have a presence. My point was really about that as a brand, there's an app for everything. You can sort of start engaging with it as a brand in a certain way. One point is having your own destination. I am Ponds and I need an app for it. I am Coca-Cola and I need an app for it. Uh, you know, the other is how do I take advantage of the fact that consumers are today using different types of apps. Uh, the, the aspect of uh, Marketing of apps is a whole separate subject altogether, uh, extremely complex. Uh, as Ajay spoke about, there are billions of apps which are getting consumed and downloaded, uh, you know, but it requires you to balance the right alliances at the same time create that unique proposition. And my advice to brands would be leverage your own media into making more fulfilling experiences you have packaging. See, digital media is one of the only medium which makes brands become media. I say this umpteen times to marketers. They'll say, I have a 10 million community on Facebook. So when you do a post and there are 712 people who respond, I'm sorry, that's not a 10 million community. You have to create content and contextuality with it. So. Any other questions? Uh, my question is to the whole board. My background is non-technology. I come from a law background and finally got into a business background. So I don't understand technology. So being the head of the organization, I have to depend on people who are knowing the technology. And lately, there's a campaign which is on called Nest Fest in Pune. I come from Pune, which is a reality campaign. And it has disrupted the whole market in terms of how the marketing is happening right from mobile application to an internet marketing coupled with on ground and what has happened is lately the campaign is super successful in creating an image which is actually not true so it has created a conceptual divide in the mind of the consumers and now they are very apprehensive which has taken a big toll on other uh, players so how do we deal with such situations uh, I don't know if I'm very clear with the question but you know, what we are finding very common or very popular is actually not very popular. And what is actually the real truth is not what I'm getting. You know, and this only happens when I've already made a purchase or something. And like in US, I have got 100% refund, et cetera, et cetera, working. But in India, it's not that easy. So I'm talking on the neg negative side of... So is it so uh, having too much information and... Uh, yeah, I mean, like so much information that we tend to take decisions which are not correct and it is having a toll on people who are really genuinely doing business just because they don't have that kind of an access probably the kind of access and presentations you have shown is not penetrated to local players like us though we are doing very well business very good business but the new players have come in and this disrupted the whole thing they are not working on the fundamentals they are big time funded <laughs> and you know the top lines are not that good and the kind of funding they've got on a valuation is like crazy. So how do we deal with, the, because we will take some time to upgrade ourselves to that technology coming to the level how Neeraj is anti, you know, viewing technology and how Mr. Das is looking at 4G and et cetera. So how do a traditional player like me work it out, you know? Just from an approach point, I know it's a very detailed question, a lot of parameters. I may sound like St. Thomas because I'm going to give you a lot of virtues. 
irrespective of the times, irrespective of the state of technology, you cannot get away with a bad product. You may do it once, you may do it maybe twice with a little bit of luck, but you'll come crashing down. So therefore, do not ever get worried about another guy doing it. You have to be concerned, you have to watch. More often than not, uh, companies talk to other companies. Boardrooms talk to boardrooms, they don't talk to the consumer. There are two or three things which are very important. This is the age of David and Goliath. Neeraj said the number of people who are on internet in India. A couple of months ago, China had 550 million people shopping on the net and they became the world's largest e-commerce country. We know that in India about 30, 40, 50 million people are buying on the net now. In fact, I'm very, very worried because my wife has got hooked onto OLX, so every time I'm checking my cupboard to see if there's a few shoes missing. The fact is that um, India will soon, India has almost 200 to 220 million people who are using the net. Now, potentially, if you were to advertise on the net versus advertising with due apologies to one of the leading dailies in the country, look at their circulation and look at the circulation of online. This is the age of David and Goliath. That's exactly what I'm saying. So for companies that are for years and years spend time on distribution, physical supply chain, etc., one guy puts out an ad and in 15 minutes he has sold off thousands and thousands of Xiaomi phones. Millions actually. In, in China they wait every Thursday for his announcement. So don't ever underestimate that. And the age-old policy is make sure that you're always relevant for the consumer. This is where I think I said at the beginning of my speech, disruption doesn't mean conning people. Disruption means bringing something which changes the threshold level. It's a new generation. When I speak to my people at Geo, I tell them, we will position, our job is not to position ourselves, but to reposition competition as telecom operators of the last decade. And life is not fair. One con man will always get away, but not forever. So these are basic marketing principles. They're nothing to do with modern day technology. I'm not saying anything that all of you don't know. Anything to add, Neeraj? Okay. Yeah, so actually I would echo a couple of points there. I think if your product itself, the offering itself has got uh, depth and connect with the consumer, I think that's what's more lasting than a short term, you know, uh, online, um, access to the consumer and so on. I'll give an example from my industry. So we have uh, uh, the online uh, channel exploding, as you all know. Uh, and uh, like I said, I think 70, 60, 70% of the business that happens through online is mobile devices because the devices lends itself to that business model. Now, uh, first time in the history of uh, mobile devices that we have in All India um, Mobile Retailers Association that has been formed uh, as a result of this. And the reason for that is, uh, to Sandeep's point, the price that a device is sold online gets to be known to people even in tier four towns and tier five towns. So the minute, for example, we have a product out there and the price is dropped by an online player, there is a uproar around the country in the offline people. And it wasn't the case earlier. In the earlier, if a retailer dropped his price, it impacted that community. Now, when an online retailer drops its price, we have to contend with thousands of retailers across the country who are saying, what's going on here? You're eating up our profits. So it is a disruption in that sense. But at the end of the day, if the product has the strength that it, uh, that it commands, you do need to manage the conflict as a principle, the channel conflict. But staying focused on what you're offering is, I think, is probably the best way to, to work your way through. Thanks. Thank you very much. Mr. Mehta, in the interest of time, we might have to take questions offline. Uh, so I would request you for offering concluding remarks. All right. Go, great. So uh, I'd like to thank, uh, just to, in, in summary, we talked about the advent of the 4G networks. We talked about the explosion in the devices, mobile devices um, uh, industry. We talked about uh, the way the apps are now uh, disrupting a lot, uh, 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 many ways in which we reach out to the consumer, many ways in which we behave as consumers ourselves. Uh, it's disrupting the way businesses are operating today. It's helping businesses in crashing uh, cycle times. So 
I think a combination of these three, it's like a perfect storm that we are going to see in the future and a massive opportunity for businesses. The 4G networks getting deployed, low-end affordable smartphones reaching the farthest recesses of this country, and of course the developers at the back of it developing apps that are going to make life easier for all of us. Looking forward to really exciting times. Thank you very much this afternoon. It's been a pleasure to bring this to you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Indeed, uh, it's been a compelling session. I request uh, you speakers to kindly be on stage with us and invite on stage Mr. S.K. Swami to kindly join us and do the honors of felicitations. Uh, a small token of our appreciation and gratitude to three of our speakers, Mr. Rajay Mehta, Mr. Sandeep Das and Mr. Neeraj Roy. A huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for all of them for such an enlightening and compelling session this afternoon. Thank you very much. And finally, a big hand once again for our chair of the session, Mr. Rajay Mehta. Thank you very much, speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, from here, we're going to be moving on straight to the next plenary session. Thank you, Mr. Swami, for doing the honors. And uh, we're going to reset the days uh, immediately. It's going to take a minute or two at the max, ladies and gentlemen, so don't go away anywhere. Uh, we're going to be heading to the next session, which is social media marketing, from social engagement to social commerce. And uh, as we reset the days uh, right here, I'm going to take this opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, of introducing our chair before I invite him and the other speakers on stage. So chairing this session from social engagement to social commerce, social media marketing, is Mr. Shubhradeep Guha, Vice President in Digital Marketing and Content Practice Lead, Sapient Nitro. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, he leads the Sapient Nitro's Digital Marketing and Content Practicing uh, and is responsible for nearly a fifth of the global work at Sapient Nitro, specializing in technology-enabled communications, emerging media, and digital marketing, he has produced several examples of award-winning customer experience innovation work and set up Sapien Nitro's practices in mobility, experience design, and interactive storytelling. Listed among the top 100 digital marketers in India, he is sought after speaker and has authored multiple articles in renowned publications. Ladies and gentlemen, can we please hear it for Mr. Shubhradeep Guha. Huge round of applause for our chair of this next session. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, our esteemed speaker for this session is Mr. Arjun Ravi Koladi, head e-commerce, Facebook India, who's joining us on stage. Big round of applauses for Mr. Guha and Mr. Koladi. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, maybe 30 seconds more before everything is said. So I would request all of you who are outside to kindly join us in. This is going to be a very, very interesting session. I am now going to uh, request Mr. Guha to kindly take charge as a chair. Hi, everyone. So I did have a few slides, which I'll wait for them to come up. But before that, uh, just wanted to acknowledge the fact that you know standing between you and lunch is typically a losing proposition. So I'm, I'm pretty daunted, you know, by you know what what I'm witnessing at this point in time. But I'll try my best and uh, you know take us through what arguably is one of the most misunderstood uh, you know areas which which we work on at, at this point in time. So what we will uh, try and do is we essentially have uh, about 45 odd minutes. The way we, you know, Arjun and I will uh, divide it up is we'll go 15 each. I'll introduce the subject. Uh, I'll start from, uh, I would say, a 10,000 foot view, take a little bit of the global context and come closer home. And then I'll hand it off to Arjun. So about 15 minutes um, for either of us. And uh, then we'll have, I would assume, another 15 minutes or, or thereabouts you know, for questions. So, uh, you know, given that we are doing it in small slices, you know, if you hold your questions a little bit and, you know, kind of le let us, you know, get through. Um, obviously, if you didn't absolutely understand a point, then fair enough, you know, feel free to interrupt and we'll, we'll, we'll handle that. But preferably, and I think, you know, that, that's the format we'll use.
So while that gets put up, the score is apparently 64, 5, and 1. And uh, Mrs. Bailey is supposed to have lost her seat. So it's a, it's, it's a pretty interesting moment for uh, everyone. As I was coming here, uh, what was interesting is both what I was picking up on Twitter, um, had a few calls from you know, you know, frantic friends, some of whom are staunch, uh, one please. Rule one of technology is obviously switch it on. So, uh, you know, what we are witnessing is probably, you know, as much of one third of the subject that we are going to talk about. We are going to talk about social uh, media marketing, and I think, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll let Arjun, you know, probably talk to it in terms of, you know, deconstructing some of that uh, story. Oh, has he? Okay, there you go. Beautiful. So, uh, apparently, the, the most dramatic election, uh, you know, results in, in Delhi. But anyway, so enough about elections. So we'll get into uh, the subject of social media, social media marketing. Um, one of the key things, you know, which I just wanted to, you know, start this conversation uh, with and try, try to ensure that we know we don't necessarily, you know, go too deep into um, the theory of it. I don't know if you know this guy, but this is a, you know, a 16-year-old, you know, typical teenager um, from Middle England. Now, the reason why he caught my attention um, is because you know, he brought to for the ways in which both social and media could come together to pretty dramatic effect. This guy's name is uh, Andy you know, Greenfield, and this is a regular guy, not, not a, you know, a teenage billionaire or anything. And all he was doing you know, sometime in early December is he was traveling, and he was traveling from Houston to Glasgow. And while he was traveling, he was traveling on Virgin trains, and as often happens in a longish train journey, he had had a bit too much to eat, and so he needed to use the toilet. And once he got into the toilet, this is what happened. So he realized that he had run out of toilet paper. So there you are in a running train, sitting inside the, the toilet, running, having run out of toilet paper. What do you do? Very, very basic, you know, kind of situation. What this man does, obviously, is he tweets. And he tweets to Virgin and says, hey, I have run out of toilet paper. So point to note, firstly, the reaction is he tweets. He doesn't call someone or whatever else. As in, on the assumption that he wasn't traveling alone, he could have called someone probably and asked for help. But he tweets. The better uh, part of the story is Virgin actually responds on the tweet and says, okay, which train and which coach are you on? He responds to that. And Virgin then responds and says, okay, we'll send someone along with, with some toilet paper. And about probably five or 10 minutes after this entire exchange would have happened, this is what happens. Someone actually does knock on the door and hand him a box of toilet paper. So, uh, you know, safe and a happy ending to, to a journey. Pretty pedantic example, you know, upholds probably the most, you know, important points, A, changes in behavior. Often, you know, nowadays, the kind of people, you know, who are probably tweeting as much as they are likely to call. Changes in behavior expected from brands. If someone is tweeting, you are expected to respond. And the response and that entire interaction may have nothing to do with what your brand story was or is. It is entirely a question of following through on whatever your promise you had made as a brand. And each of those, and that, surprisingly, is a moment of truth. And that moment of truth is pretty much what we would have read about as a concept when you know, many of us were you know, doing our basics in marketing, except that it's translated in this manner in today's world. So quite literally, you know, I just wanted to start with, you know, sorry to do this before lunch, but then you know, I, I was hoping to start a little bit earlier. But there you go. So it does you know, drive the point home uh, as such. The interesting part is, despite this example, most brands use social as a channel, as just another channel. And obviously, you know, the, the very things that make you do things the other way will also make you, you know, treat this, you know, social as a channel. After all, if you look at that, you know, those numbers around 2 billion or thereabouts. So firstly, you know, apparently there are 2 billion social network users worldwide. I'll go with that number. You know, what it tells me, it's about a third of humanity at this point in time, worldwide. 
and this is including you know many large tracts of you know probably a third of india which is you know way impoverished to be able to you know kind of be anywhere onto that or large parts of africa but overall you're still saying already a third of humanity is is actively using social media in, in some particular form there are some other fantastic you know kind of numbers apparently you know 2.5 million posts in facebook every minute and so on and so forth so um, you know we will we'll have arjun probably talk to the, that a little bit more but if you look at this it's very easy to completely be persuaded that this is a great channel let's go after it you know there are you know so many people doing so many things what if i can advertise there what if i can you know, kind of go and yell from the rooftops in that particular space but that is exactly where also the the dilemma exists because these are people who are using that particular channel for a completely channel for a completely different purpose you and i on social media typically are not out there you know to be targets for some marketer as individuals you and i are out there meeting some very specific needs which are human needs that of connecting with people till about 5 to 10 years ago you and i did not have the the ability to connect with that long lost you know classmate you know who had been with me you know when i was i was graduating from class 3 to class 5 thereafter i have lost touch with him 10 or 15 years ago the only way i would have bumped into him or her would have been you know by accident entirely by accident sometime in the next you know 30 40 50 years right now i can actually search for him just because you know i happen to and can find him and completely dictate the amount of connection i want to have with him i don't necessarily need to go meet him and have dinner if i don't want to but i do know that i can settle for the comfort of being connected with him so i can reach out and he can reach out when we need to when we want to this is a complete change in behavior that has happened which is what is driving in most of my decisions nowadays and re reasonably high value decisions i'm sure as as are yours are often driven by you know what i call the yellow stars and these are essentially reviews and stars which you know, uh, typical visitors will have on any e-commerce website or you know most most such you know um, forums have you considered the fact that the very five stars or four stars that you're basing major decisions on are actually contributed to by rank strangers who you do not know at all you and them may actually share nothing at all in common you know as consumers and yet their decision is likely to influence your purchasing decision and there is something deeply human about it because you know you are reaching out to a tribal instinct which we probably never had but now we do if you place it in that context you realize what we are dealing with in social is a consumer evol evolution now the challenge consequently for us as marketers when we wear the hat of marketers is how do you take you know play a role within that conversation without trying to fundamentally sabotage that model and and that is you know typically what we often we, we are guilty of but if you acknowledge the fact that this is a consumer evolution that has happened and we are essentially entering that conversation you realize that the first change is i cannot enter only as a brand i have to enter as a brand who is a person because it's a conversation amongst people in 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 the social media so a brand cannot be a brand it has to become a person in order to be, to do that also you have to participate in a conversation just like you know you would be put off if i stood here and talked for the next 3 hours i need to allow you to to talk and we have a conversation as a brand i can't stand there and do only do the talking and 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 hog the airwaves people will just move away that's literally what what they will do so when you apply all of these i think a few things become interesting and this is one of the the pieces which i found amazing that spiky graph on the left you know essentially implies that probably about 2/3 of marketers spend 6 hours or less a week in looking at and monitoring social media from the purpose of marketing so as a job but the same person so 6 hours a week or less right a same set of individuals are likely to spend over 3 hours a day on social media so that alone will give you the gap in terms of the amount of effort that's going in there and the amount of you know work that has been done in order to understand it so naturally again you are seeing you know this is a relatively cheap and cheerful approach which we as marketers are often guilty of where we are taking where we are, you know our approach is okay there's something going on bunch of people out there let me you know the equivalent of us opening a chai stall you know every, every time it, you know you find a group of people out there and that is what you know many of us are guilty of and we are guilty of riding on trends so there is a trend around audio and, and and video you know hogging far more social media so you have twitter you know which which have uh, you know launched their direct messages snapchat came up with their discover and and most of you are seeing that and you and and, and that's a genuine trend increasingly we are finding the power of uh, motion picture 
and audio uh, content, which, which is pretty useful. Having said that, it doesn't necessarily translate for a brand in order to just put their, their television commercial and put it online. Uh, there's, the same, there's the same mistake out there, because what we just did is we treated it as a channel, and we didn't go beyond merely messaging. Now, this is the first piece. So in, think of yourself as an individual. You are have, you're looking to have a conversation. You're looking to build a relationship with the people at your own pace. Whereas as the moment you wear the hat of a marketer, all you want to do is shout out your message. Yes, yeah, so there's no more storytelling, there's story yelling going on, because I'm just trying to quite literally blurt out my message, and I'm ex excited by the fact that there are a few million users out there, 2.5 million you know, fresh posts every minute um, out there. That's what is, is exciting me. And here's an example you know, which, I, which I picked up. This is GoPro. This is what you get to see on GoPro's YouTube page. They don't go, go about saying that you know, we are a camera manufacturer, you know, we have taken a particular point of view. Now, this is a point of view camera. So the obvious thing that they have done is they have essentially put in a whole bunch of user-generated content which is curated, but which enables you to figure out what to do with the product that you have. Very early stage, but it's still a d definite movement from you know, recasting your website onto your YouTube channel. So you have explicitly put in there, there's activity going on. Every time I go, go to that page, there's some fresh new content with, you know, where someone has used that same product in a completely different manner, very engaging. You know, there's something for me as a, as a possible user to do. Or for that matter, what I thought, you know, maybe you know, our own Incredible India campaigns can take some um, you know, inspiration from is you know, Visit Britain. What they have, this is their Tumblr page. And again, if you notice, what they have done is a combination of both user-generated content, but also they are soliciting conversation on specific subjects. So they, as much as they are putting their own message out, please come and visit you know, this town or that city or this countryside, they are drawing the users in in order to publish what, what people do. Uh, another you know, great example is Universal. If you compare Universal and Disney, uh, Disney's you know, social experience is largely around princesses and Mickey Mouse and you know, all those characters. Whereas Universal's experience, which I found was pretty telling, is all about you and me as users standing in front of Universal's logo in either Singapore you know, or in Florida or wherever else with our own pictures, with our own families or us you know, striking poses or whatever else. It's entirely about me, the user, not Universal. And there's a distinction in, in terms of you know, how they are op operating out there. And there's something out there in terms of figuring out how brands you know, make that journey in order to get to uh, extend the power of brands through social. Remember that social is a very human mechanism. It's, 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 some, it's a place where all of us are having a conversation. There's a ton of emotion. There's a ton of expectation, basic human stuff. So the, uh, the ability for a brand to become a person is massive if you were to take this opportunity out there. And as I gave you in that Virgin uh, you know, Trains example, they, it, it, it's, it's not meant to be, you know, it, would have, it was probably the Twitter feed was being manned by someone in the Department of Communications out there. Their job, their brief is not to answer for calls for toilet paper. So they could have com you know, completely ignored that or dealt with it very differently, and you, know, you wouldn't have had much to do about that particular scenario. It's not clear how, you know, whether there would have been any downward impact, but what they chose to do in, is what has fundamentally differentiated it. And another example around JetBlue, who have quite literally used their Twitter feed as a customer service engine, quite literally. And what is amazing is this is number three in terms of res response rates worldwide. But that was actually not what I was excited about. What I loved about it was the fact that if you tweet it, and I have tried it, a maximum response time of nine minutes, which is shorter than the hold time when I have to listen to music if I call their uh, toll-free number directly, or even if I try to use the, the automated IVR machine. Even then, my entire wait time is longer than nine minutes. So suddenly, it's a completely functional usage of a social media property which is being used to drive and generate customer service, as simple as that. So each brand is finding its, its own way in order to, you know, as to how you leverage uh, that particular piece. This is obviously number one in response rates, T-Mobile, specifically focused on the US. Dowdy utility you know, kind of provider, you would have thought, right, in, uh, out there. Nine out of 10 engagements out there with, you know, between people like con consumers are actually handled by the company itself. So you can actually talk to people. So nine out of 10 are conversations happening you know, between a brand and a customer. And this is a big, large brand. It's a mass brand. It probably has a, has, a, has a few million customers out there. 
completely different orientation as to what they have taken. So they're not necessarily saying, you know, here's, we, here's how cool we are and this is what we are launching. They're just having a conversation with you and it would happen on multiple different subjects, uh, which is pretty uh, cool, which gets you into the whole social commerce part of it, which is another, you know, much misunderstood, uh, you know, segment as to where exactly, you know, do we play on, on, on social commerce. Now, the interesting part is why social in social commerce is, you know, is of interest to us is because you are operating surprisingly in an atmosphere of trust. If, if the 10 of us who are you know, friends from school are having a conversation and one of us happens to say, by the way, you know, my television which I just bought from brand X you know, seems to be you know, really good and really smart and I'm really happy about it as compared to brand Y, the propensity of my buying brand X is significantly higher simply because I trust his judgment. He has no ax to grind. He doesn't work for brand X, so he's not trying to sell me anything. So I am actually treating it, the same expression, tribal instinct, I'm treating it as genuine customer feedback and I say, okay, great, so maybe I should you know, look at brand X. Maybe I should actually go to this destination. Maybe I should stay in, in this particular hotel. It is, as he says, it's child friendly. And that's the orientation which I go in with. So in that, that's, that's precisely why brands are trying to play in that particular space because you are take, able to take advantage of a moment of trust. So if a brand is able to build that, you're one of us, you have gained that particular piece of trust, chances are you, know, you and I are having a conversation you know, where I'm not second guessing your, in, your motives. And that is an extremely you know, interesting story. So this is the, you know, I, I found this one was you know, classic copycat approach but good execution. So something which Coke has made a virtue out of which is personalized. So remember the personalization of the Coke cans? You know, Heinz does exactly that. Taken, they have taken soup, put it out there on their Facebook page, you know, and this is what they've done in, in, in the, in, in, on their British, uh, Web, you know, I would say, you know, audience, get well soup. So if, if someone is unwell, a friend or, or someone is unwell, I happen to actually send them a personalized, you know, can of soup, it's, it's get well soup, that's all you're doing, you're just personalizing it. And you're using social media to be able to deliver and generate that particular experience. You know, completely, you know, interesting way of looking at it. Chances are, would I have considered soup if I were, were to you know, kind of go meet a friend, you know, who's unwell? Or frankly, I may not have even gone to meet him, I would have just, you know, sent him a text saying, hey, you know, bro, get, get, get well soup. But here I am, you know, sending him probably a can of soup. Interesting, you know, angle around, you know, how commerce could potentially, you know, creep into that particular conversation. Or for that matter, in the US, pet food, Halo, supposedly premium positioning, you know, what they, you know, play on is the exact same thing which charity, you know, providers will typically play on. So for your pet, who is in your house, who's clearly being well cared for, there might be at least one more adopted dog or a cat in a shelter or in a dog pound out there. So every time you feed your dog, will you do something which potentially makes life better for the adopted dog in the shelter? That's the sentiment. So what do you do? Feed it forward. All that is happening is that you know, every time you're, you're feeding the dog, you're potentially you know, uploading a video of it or, 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 or whatever, and you are playing with a Twitter feed which essentially generates an additional count which enables you know, Halo to you know, donate a, a can of pet food in, into uh, the dog ponds or the shelters. And you actually had people doing it. Sales doubled. Sales doubled in, in a matter of three weeks. On, just on that simple thing, which is like, you know, my dog seems to be having a good life. While it, I, I buy its, its pet food, can I possibly contribute? I'm not necessarily buying any, anything literally, you know, for the, the, for, for the dogs in the shelter, but I just happen to, you know, contribute in this manner. And that's, again, you know, is, is something which, where you're driving commerce. Or, of course, as you can see, I just, I, I just thought that the 22 million likes was so obscenely massive that it needed to be put out there. But this is Nike. You know, sitting on top of a massive marketing engine, you know, a, a massive amount of work that they can do. Um, and look at, look at the emphasis in, in terms of you know, how they're using social. So they are not saying, please come and buy my trainers. They are not saying, you know, just do it, quite literally. But what they are doing is they have built on their overall marketing theme of wellness and fitness. And they're saying, please do consider getting out of your house every morning. Oh, and understand it might be you know, really cold and there's this Arctic chill and whatever else. In that context, shall we talk about our hyper warm range of, of apparel which has been well engineered, which is intended to keep you warm even as you go for your morning run. Quite literally, what they have done is they have introduced a, a different product line in the context 
of enabling, pushing you out your door or out of your bed first thing in the morning so that you are fit in line with whatever is the marketing uh, promise there. So there is a small button on the you know, bottom right, if you notice, it says shop. So you know, can I shop directly from there? Most likely. But it's in the context where you have created the need of positioning Nike's role, not just as your wellness partner or your fitness partner, but also as someone who takes care of your needs. One of the most basic needs, which is too cold, how do I get out? Yeah, and, and so those are you know, some of the examples which I just wanted to kind of share with you in the context of teeing up what I find. You know, social media marketing is entirely a you know, conversation around the story which the brand has to tell. But in light of the context in which that story needs to be told. And the context, as much as the, we use the word social in this piece, comes back to the individual or the individuals who are having that conversation. So it's extremely important, you know, you, we strike that balance between the two, which is why you know, I've shown it you know, as a simple Venn diagram where you have to have that overlap between a brand story and a social context. You know, without the brand story, you and I are having a chat. Without the social context, you're just yelling at me and I'm going to tune off. But when you put the two together, that's when magic happens. And that's pretty much you know, what, what we have to talk about in you know, social media marketing. So on that note, um, I'm actually going to you know, quickly pass it on to Arjun. Arjun, you're up right off.